Hello and welcome to Beginners Python and Machine Learning. My name is Tim Cummings. Uh, every week we try to present a, a session on uh, something to do with uh, starting to program in Python or in uh, getting started in machine learning. And tonight we're going to be looking at Python. Uh, it's the first week of the month so we uh, try to make it even simpler like you've never seen uh, any of this stuff before. Um, and so uh, tonight's topic we're going to be talking about virtual environments in Python um, which although you might not think is uh, a, a absolute beginners topic it's possibly one of the first things that beginners can come across even if they don't realize it and um, they'll have the potential to um, really make a mess of things on their system Python if they don't do it properly so I thought I'd um, give a session just so that you can uh, have a look at um, virtual environments and, and maybe be able to spot um, how they, they work on your system. Uh, now during the session, it's a live session, so you can ask questions. Um, I'll be monitoring uh, the sp uh, Slack channel, um, Beginners Python, and there's uh, in the Learning to Code channel. Um, and you'll see that I've put a link in here for tonight's session um, so you just ask questions below that. Um, I'll also try to follow uh, the YouTube uh, live chat um, as we go along. Uh, so it's a hands-on session so um, you should try to uh, follow along by doing the actual uh, there's not, no real challenges as such tonight but um, you can uh, type stuff in as I'm ty typing it in and and just see how it works all right now I've got a script that we're going to follow and there's a link here so if you're watching the YouTube video um, which I assume you are uh, then you'll see uh, the link just below and it's to our github site which has got um, the script so if you click on that that will bring up uh, this script here um, which has got um, it's got the links to the YouTube video links to this github site and also to our meetup site uh, and also on this in this github repository you can find all our other sessions as well okay so we're going to learn how to how, how and why to create uh, virtual environments and you can do it in both python and anaconda i'm going to be concentrating mostly on python uh, tonight but i will show you how um, anaconda does it um, and also uh, how to run the python scripts um, that we write using that virtual environment from either the command line um, from VS Code and from PyCharm and so VS Code and PyCharm are two integrated development environments very popular um, for Python coding. Um, as a corollary we're going to uh, clone a git repository and this will be one that we had an exercise in an in-person session we had um, and trying to get people to clone the Git repository which had a lot of machine learning stuff in it. Um, we found just a lot of uh, problems that people had. So uh, we'll try to run you through the procedure here. Uh, so the next time we're in an in-person session and you're asked to do cloning the Git repository, yeah, you might know how to do it. Um, and we're also going to run uh, Jupyter Notebooks in VS Code, uh, which sometimes is a requirement okay uh, just recently we had another uh, session on creating um, virtual environments using PyM from PDM that's for your more advanced users who are doing um, you know deployment of uh, Python code applications that they've written and um, but yeah s please look that one up if, if that's the sort of thing that you're interested in okay so uh, we're going to start off um, with installing Python. Now Python you can install on your computer. You can do it through uh, the Python website, python.org um, or Anaconda is another one. So um, Anaconda, um, although it's free, it has got some licensing issues um, and uh, if for the sort of stuff that I do it actually adds a bit more complexity um, that I don't need. So I prefer to just install Python straight from python.org um, and the, the virtual environment support in uh, just vanilla Python is a lot better these days and so I think that um, you can get by without using the Anaconda 
um, stuff. Anaconda tends to install a lot of third-party libraries by default, and um, that can be uh, that can confuse your system. Okay, so um, if we install um, from Python uh, from Python.org, so if we go to Python.org, uh, let's have a look at the the website. So they've got here you can download for Windows uh, Python 3.12.2. Um, I'm going to show you some screenshots when I installed it on Windows. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the first one that comes up, and uh, we're just uh, a lot of people uh, come along and have who don't have admin access on their computers, and that's where um, you're going to have uh, more problems. So um, I'm going to try to do it without using any admin privileges. So I've turned off this one. Use admin privileges when installing py.exe, and um, and add python.exe.path. I'm not going to do that. Uh, we're just going to do this one. Install now, and that's going to install it into um, the user's um, home folder. My user home folder here is called Pytho um, into app data local progr programs. Okay, so I'm going to do that one rather than customize installation. If you do customize installation, you'll be able to install it globally for all users on your computer, um, but you will need admin access to do that. Okay, and it just it didn't ask any anything else. It got to this page here. Uh, let me just close it. Um, so installing Python was quite simple. It does give you this option here for disabling the path length limit. Um, I've never tried this, um, although I have hit the, the path length limit sometimes on Windows. Um, but I, uh, I figure for me it's probably better if I stay within the limit um, so that if I'm using other people's computers on the same path that um, I don't accidentally create files with long path uh, long paths that then they can't access so I haven't chosen that all right so now that Python is installed um, we can uh, try running it on the um, uh, we, we can try running it and creating a virtual environment. So this is our script here. Um, so we're going to do this in uh, from the command prompt. So if you're on Mac or Linux, you just open a terminal window. Um, and on Windows, um, I'm going to open the command prompt. So I just click on the start menu and I type CMD. And you can see command prompt comes up, so I'll click on that. Okay, so I'd be interested um, uh, to see how people go with this um, because everyone's computer is different and you know there's slight nuances in the way things have installed, even the order. Like I've, I've only just installed Python, but I've installed Python in the past and maybe there's, there's some remnants of that previous install that might affect the way things happen. Okay, so um, Actually, to make this work, I'm just going to go and rename a folder that um, I've already created so that you can see it from scratch. Okay. So I'm going to copy the first line in. So I'm going to make a directory in my home path, which is where I am anyway, so I, I possibly didn't need to say that, and it's going to be called um, Beginners Python and Machine Learning Episode 200. Okay, so that's now created um, a directory. If I look in my list of directories, I can see it's just created this new directory here. I can now uh, change into that directory. And you can see here in the prompt, it's telling me what directory I'm in. I'm in users backslash pytho backslash bpml200. And now I'm going to create a virtual environment. Now I'm going to use uh, pi. And it may be that pi got installed with administrator privileges from an earlier install of mine. Um, but let me know how you go with doing this command. So um, pi gets installed on Windows and we'll find the latest version of Python that you've got installed. Um, this is a bit different to uh, Mac and Linux. On Mac and Linux, you <coughs> you'll be just running Python 3, and that'll just give you 
um, your default Python 3 install. So I've got the Mac and Linux instructions down below. We're going to create, uh, we're going to run the module VENV which comes with Python. Um, it's pre-installed on Windows, pre-installed on Mac. Actually if you're on Linux you might have to install uh, an app package, apt install uh, Python 3-virtualenv and that will um, then give you access to this module VENV and we're going to name it something so I'm just, I decided to call it VENV200 um, just so that we can be clear what we're actually creating. Uh, so let's let's run this command. Okay, so this is creating a virtual environment. So it's actually putting a Python executable, which is the um, <coughs> Python um, dot exe uh, program that will run every to run uh, so it can interpret any of your scripts that you've written. So if I now look in my directory, you can see it's created a folder called venv200. So there's our virtual environment. We've created it, and um, but it's not yet active. So the next thing we need to do is activate the script. And we can do that just by running uh, m200 backslash, and then because it's installed on Windows, we've got um, the active environment has the the virtual environment has a scripts folder, and in that scripts folder, there's a um, script called activate.bat, which is what we're going to run uh, from Windows. So when I run that, we've now activated the script. And you can see it's now got VENV200 at the beginning. Okay, uh, now Serena has said, where can I find the link for today's, today's session? So I'll just reply to her um, in learning to code. So hopefully she can find a way there. All right. Now, the, when the virtual environment is active, it's it um, the name of it is at the um, is put into the prompt, uh, so you can tell whether it's active or not. Now, um, I've got over here instructions on how to do the same thing in Anaconda. When Anaconda um, also creates virtual environments for us. They do it in a slightly different way. Um, the folder is not, the VEMV200 folder will not occur, be seen in BPAML200 folder. It'll be stored with all the other virtual environments that Anaconda installs. Um, and so you have to refer to it by name because it won't be in the current directory. And then you can um, uh, activate it um, from wherever you are. I've shown you how you can install extra libraries using Anaconda virtual environments and soon we'll get down to um, installing uh, libraries into our Python virtual environments. But first of all, uh, let's look at um, installing uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Code and the Git uh, source code manager so that we can uh, get some uh, clone a repository and um, we can also do a bit of stuff in, in uh, Git Bash. All right, so I find the easiest way is to go to the Microsoft Store. So that's just um, in your Start menu. You just go to Microsoft Store and uh, to install VS Code. And you just do a search on VS Code and you'll see the one here, VS Code. And you click over here where it says free and that'll become an install button and then you can install um, VS Code. All right, um, now Git Source Code Manager. Let's have a look at that. So here we can download it for Windows um, 2.44. So let's go along and it gives us a few different options here. Um, if you've got admin access, I think 64-bit Git for Windows setup is the best one to use. Um, but if you don't have admin access, then uh, try this portable version. Um, it's just a zip file of the Git executables. 
so uh, you can install it that way so I'll, um, once again I do 64-bit for everything because um, we're using more than 4 gigs of RAM these days and 32-bits uh, getting less and less supported uh, so grab the, the portable if you download that that will give you a, a zip file now I'm going to uh, to install that put that into a folder so I've created a folder called apps and in there I've copied in my 7-zip file uh, that I downloaded and then I just executed that and that created a folder here called portable git and now from portable git I can uh, run the commands bit ga uh, git bash and git command so there's just some things here bin yep so bin is the, the where the binary is installed okay so one of the reasons I like git bash is it lets me run bash rather than command prompts so they're both just shells where you get a command line you can type stuff in but git bash is a, um, very similar to uh, Mac and Linux and so I can pretty much do the same commands on all of them so let's run uh, git bash just straight out of the uh, portable git folder and it fires up another window um, very similar to the command prompt um, but it's got uses forward slashes rather than backslashes okay so let's make that a bit smaller we'll make this one we'll put this one back down here and on the right we'll have our web browser that's giving us our script okay so now this one's a bash shell and uh, these are the commands that you would do if you were only using the bash shell um, so you'd make a directory in our home directory uh, a subdirectory straight of home called uh, bpaml200 which we've already done uh, we need to change into that directory so I can just type that change into BP and I can just use the tab for uh, tab, tab completion I'm now in that folder if I want to see what's in the folder rather than DIR I'm using bash so it's LS and you can see my virtual environment folder is there now uh, I can create uh, this folder and if I'd done that on uh, Mac or Linux it would have had a created a subfolder called bin but because it's done it here it's got a subfolder called scripts um, and this time I'll run the activate um, to activate my virtual environment uh, rather than activate.bat which I did when I was in command prompt so I don't think command batch files are going to work here and you see it's a bit different we use the um, source command to run the script and that just gives it access to any environment variables in the bash environment so these uh, they love their environment variables here so script activate and I'll just run that and you can see I've now got my um, virtual environment name is coming up before the prompt now once I'm in the my virtual environment I can see what has been installed um, using the pip command <coughs> And pip tells me I've just got one package installed, which is pip itself. And I could do the same down here in command prompt. The same thing, pip list. And it tells me I've just got the one thing installed. So uh, that's better. Let's try um, deactivating the virtual environment. And then try pip list and pip is not even recognized um, so what Python is doing um, is actually making it harder and harder to use pip outside of a virtual environment because that's that's when you can um, you can create problems if you start installing third-party libraries using pip into the system Python then you know you've, you've damaged the system Python for anyone who's using it um, for you, if you're using it for any other uh, well I mean it, it gets used for system functions that's the reason it's installed there not really for your use um, but you can 
um, you can use it uh, or if it's if you're using just the one that you've installed you're still corrupting it for any of your other projects that you might be working on so it's um, it's best to keep because each of your projects requires a different set of third-party libraries and they can interact in ways that are not always obvious and so um, it uh, you can write some code and it'll run on your your computer just fine but when you give it to someone else it just doesn't run and that's because um, unbeknownst to you it's used some third-party library that um, that uh, they don't have installed and you didn't know you had it installed because you were just using a, a common environment that one of your other programs was had it installed for. Alright, uh, so I'll just go and activate this again. Okay. Um, so what can you do here? You can upgrade your version of PIP. We've actually got the latest one already so we don't need to do that. So let's try installing a third-party library. So let's install this one called python-.env. Uh, get rid of the caps lock. So if I just type pip install python.env, it'll go off to uh, pipi.org and it'll um, find it. Uh, it's collected the package. It found that I've actually cached it um, locally, so it was a bit faster than normal, but it found version 1.0.1 .1, and it's installed that uh, in this virtual environment. So now if I do pip list, it tells me that it's got that um, third party library installed. And similarly down here, that should also have it. So now anything I write. Uh, any Python script I use uh, can use that uh, that library. Um, and I've showed you how to deactivate when you want to stop using your virtual environment. Okay, so let's clone uh, this um, Anthropic Claude 3 masterclass that Arun wrote for us the other night. And um, it's got some nice um, scripts in there that we might be able to use. So let's copy that code. This one you have to run from git bash um, because uh, command prompt won't know git where git is on your computer because we didn't install it with admin um, rights. Um, so to copy and paste, uh, to paste into git bash, you can see uh, Okay, it's um, shift insert is the paste command. It normally tells me there. I'm not sure why it's not telling me what the paste command is. Um, but shift insert is the paste command. Insert being one of your keys on the keyboard. Okay, so that's made a, a clone of that um, Git repository, uh, which is like a really useful way of. Um, downloading code just cloning the repository and so now we've got two uh, subdirectories in our bpaml200 directory um, it's also available down here if I did a dir there it is okay so feel free to ask any questions if I'm doing anything too quickly um, or I skipped over a, a, a step that you might have missed okay uh, so let's try running uh, one of these things uh, from so running some Python uh, in VS Code. So to run VS Code, um, okay, so let's do it first. We'll do it from the start menu. So it's been recently installed. Uh, let's see, it'll be down here, Visual Studio Code, and there it is. So you could just type code and it will find it for you. But I'll try to do stuff um, from scratch. Okay. And there it is. Let's move it over to the left hand side. Um, so this is a, a fresh install of VS Code. It's got uh, no extensions. It hasn't even got a folder opened. And that's a pretty important part of VS Code is it, it, it uh, considers folders like projects 
Um, so if you create a folder, it'll create a hidden folder within that and store, store information about it. But until you open a folder, it's, it's really at a bit of a loss. So the first thing we'll do is we'll open a folder and we'll open our BPAML 200 folder. So I'll just click on open folder there. I probably shouldn't have used that one because that button, because that button might be there next time. So select folder. But I could have gone to the file menu and said file open folder. So that would be the traditional way of opening a folder. Okay, so now I've opened the folder and this icon here on the left says I'm now looking at files. Um, in my Explorer so I can hide that or show it by clicking on it click again to hide click again to show it shows this little sidebar and that tells me what files are in this folder there's the folder name BPAML 200 it's got our cloned repository in it and it's got our virtual environment in it um, so we want to write uh, some Python code so I've got a little Python script here which just tells me which Python is, is actually running um, so I'm going to create a file here so if I select I've selected the, um, the main folder and I click on the new file and it'll create a folder file in that folder and let's just call it hello dot py and um, so you can see down here uh, Microsoft has recommended seen that we're writing a Python program it says recommended uh, do you want to use the uh, Python extension from Microsoft and this is actually quite a good extension uh, so this is one we are going to need uh, to make it easier for us to write run and debug uh, Python scripts so let's install that one so I'll install it um, it's installing now and so if I look over here in my list of uh, extensions I can see that it's currently installing so VS Code itself is quite a lightweight integrated development environment and you build up its features by adding these extensions um, a lot of it's a bit of magic behind the scenes so um, that's why I'm trying to show you the steps um, so you can see exactly which um, extensions have been installed because otherwise I'll just come with a, a VS Code all loaded up with extensions and does all sorts of things that your VS Code doesn't do. Okay, so I'll paste in a little bit of code there and we'll save that. See it's got the dot there so it hasn't been saved yet. So I'll do uh, Control S to save. okay and now we can run it because we've installed that Python extension we've now got a little play button up here to run the Python file and uh, we can run it okay so it opens up a new terminal window down the bottom and look which version of Python it's uh, used it's used the one that's in our virtual environment VNV 200 uh, to run our little shell a uh, little script so because we've uh, got a virtual environment inside the folder that um, this project is um, the Python extension was able to find it so that's pretty useful um, and we can also look down here see that in the bottom right it tells us what what version of Python it is 3.12.2 tells us what the name of the virtual environment is it's VNV 200 tells us what it is it's a venv virtual environment and it also gives us the path to the python.exe that's going to be used uh, so when we ran it let's hide this uh, it output two things the first one that's the sys.version so 3.12.2 and the second one is the sys.executable uh, which tells us where, where the python.exe file is that was used to run this script so that's pretty useful um, but I find that a bit magic that it, it found the virtual environment but I'm, I'm not going to complain I think that was a that's a good thing that it's using this virtual environment okay uh, so let's read about virtual environments in VS Code so if it finds one uh, notice the name that's right we've done that okay so let's um, 
we can actually create a new virtual environment using this Python extension. Uh, so the way you can do that is you click on the Venv name uh, to select or create a different virtual environment. So let's do that. Let's go down here and I'm going to click on it and it's, it gives me the option. It's brought up the um, uh, what do they call it? The path, the, the command path thing to what we can do and we can uh, create a virtual environment or we can use the selected one which is this one here or we can use this one here the global one that's the one we don't want to use so never choose global they've, they've marked it in um, big letters there global do not which basically means do not use this one use one of these virtual ones that's been created just for a particular project but I think we'll create a new one and see how that goes. So I'll click on create a virtual environment. Now I can, I've got two options. I can create a Venv or a Conda. So if you've got Anaconda installed, then choose Conda. Otherwise we've got uh, Python installed, so we'll use Venv. Um, select the Python installation to create the virtual environment. So now this is where you choose the global one to say, I want it to be based on this particular global um, Python and so it'll have that same version number in the virtual environment that gets created. So down here we're creating our environment um, and when that's done it should tell us the name of the new environment. Now you notice it didn't actually let us choose the name and that's because it will always call it .venv um, for a VMV environment when you're using VS Code. So if you've got one with a different name that's okay you can select it but you can't create one with a different name using VS Code. All right, starting new terminal in VS Code gives warning that the virtual environment name may not show. Uh, okay, so let's try that. Let's try a new command prompt. Okay, um, so I've added a new one using this plus. I want it to be a command prompt. And it said the following extensions have contributed to this terminal's environment. Um, and they've activated the environment .venv. So that's good. It's actually even got the .venv there. That's good. So I know that anything that I'm doing will have um, will be using that virtual environment. Uh, so let's try a PowerShell. Okay, PowerShell. Once again, it's activated that environment. Um, shell integration failed to activate. I think that's probably saying that it, it's not showing us the name of the virtual environment. That's a that's a big uh, downfall of this system. It should always show you at the beginning of this prompt uh, what virtual environment is active. So anyway, well, um, that's uh, VS Code. Of course, it is a, an IDE that's just built on extensions, uh, so they don't have total control over everything. Okay, so our next uh, thing we're going to try to do is um, we're going to open an IPYNB file, uh, which is a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, that, and there are some in our Git repository. So we look up to here, File Explorer, have a look at our files. We've already done a Python script, which is hello.py. And now in this folder, which I can expand by clicking on the greater than sign, we've got some IPYNB files. Uh, these are Jupyter Notebooks. I'll click on the first one. And let's just make this a bit bigger. I'll hide the file names because we've seen them. Okay, so it's a like a Jupyter notebook, but we can't do anything with it really at uh, at this stage um, because we haven't selected a, a kernel. So up in the top right, it's telling us, it's asking us what uh, what kernel do we want to use, uh, and that's that's because Jupyter notebooks require a Jupyter kernel. So let's see what we can choose here. I've clicked on it um, and it allows us to install a suggested extension which is the Jupyter extension. Now I'd recommend this one as well and then it'll, uh, you'll have a lot more features with Jupyter Notebooks. So let's install that extension uh, which it's now installing down the bottom. We can see now it uh, can detect kernels 
Uh, do we want a Python environment or an existing Jupyter server? Well, we don't have any existing Jupyter servers. So let's choose a Python environment. And we can choose uh, one of the two ones that we've created, our virtual env here that we just created, or the venv200 that we created before. Uh, let's do the .venv. Okay. Uh, so that's the where it's going to uh, use uh, the Jupyter kernel. Of course, it doesn't have a Jupyter kernel in there yet, but let's anyway. Let's move on. Uh, so the first thing I want to do, let's try running a cell. I'll try running this cell here. And it says running cells uh, with .venv requires a kernel. Okay, let's install it. So down the bottom we can see that it's installing. This is a lot easier than it used to be to set up Jupyter Notebooks on your own computer. Jupyter Notebooks is a, a, um, a way of setting up interactive Python. Um, and it's a really good way of learning Python because you, you can run just a few lines at a time, see exactly what they do, and you get immediate um, feedback. And, and you can use it as um, in a report-like way. Um, people have got blogs based just on Jupyter Notebooks. Um, the, each notebook is a combination of text cells with formatted text and code cells, uh, as you can see. So this is all just formatted text at the top here. See big letters for installation. And then some code cells. All right. Um, so I'm going to add another code cell here at the beginning. So you can see I just hovered above the, the previous cell and it gave me a plus code button and now I'm going to do a, a Jupyter Notebook feature. We, they're normally Python code cells but you can actually jump down to the command line and um, run a command by using the exclamation mark and we're going to install python.env. So if I run that it's given me some error messages because it's looking it's doing some Python checking rather than command line. Um, but anyway, it ran fine in 2.3 seconds. It installed python.env. And then I can go down to this cell. I don't have to run them in order. Uh, in fact, it tells me what order I ran them. So that was the second one I ran. This one here is the third one. And that now runs fine. It gave me false. Um, but I can also install Anthropic um, here. Arun has commented this out so it doesn't run all the time. But uh, you just remove the comment, and now you can run it, and that will install Anthropic. And when you so we're just installing one library here, but it works out that Anthropic is actually dependent on a whole bunch of other libraries, and so that uh, it will install them as well. Uh, so it's just downloading it at the moment from Pippi. Um, it's finding all the dependencies and collecting them as well. I'll just convert this to a scrollable element. Um, and these are all the third-party libraries. Just by installing that one third-party library, it found all the dependencies uh, that are required for it to run, and it's installed them automatically. Okay, well that was pretty useful. And then you can keep going, just running page by page. I mean, that'll probably throw an error. No. Anyway, that's um, so. That's how you would run this Jupyter Notebook. So it runs quite well in um, uh, in VS Code. So let's, uh, I'll just save that. Alright, what are we going to do next? Okay, so you saw we've uh, opened this folder as a um, from the file menu uh, to get into it. But another way, which is actually um, uh, what a lot of people do um, for making sure they're in, they open the right folder in code. Uh, so I'm just going to close the folder now to show that there's nothing, nothing open. And now I'm going to quit, quit code, VS Code. Um, so what you can do is you can um, activate a script. So here we are. We're activated one vem 200, and now we can run. Uh, VS Code while that script is activated, and that will tell it that's where we, we want it to. Um, that's the script we want activated um, when we're not running in VS Code. VS Code on the command line is just code, C O D E, 
and then we put a dot to say the current directory so I want to run code from the current directory and I could have done this from the command prompt or from git bash and um, and let's run it and so the current directory will be the folder that it opens uh, when it starts so there we go it's opened our folder it's remembered that when we last were in this folder this was the file that we had open um, it's recommending more extensions which I don't need um, let's go to hello and we can see that the active um, script is vem the active virtual environment is vem 200 so that's all good um, it didn't affect the Jupyter one so Jupyter is still using dot v and v um, so a bit of inconsistency there um, but uh, anyway just keep an eye on that okay um, yeah so Scott's asked uh, should he use spider or VS code um, so uh, I um, I've tried using spider a couple of times it's it's not a very um, like it was good in its day but it's um, you know now the other IDEs are a lot better um, so a lot of people are using VS code and if you're doing uh, Jupyter notebooks I definitely recommend VS code um, if you are doing just Python scripting um, then I'd actually recommend PyCharm which is the one that we'll be getting on to next okay so VS code was designed probably started being more for JavaScript um, projects and then they by putting extensions in they managed to adapt it for other languages um, but yeah it's these are much better than spider both of them okay um, all right that's code so now we've got let's have a look at PyCharm community edition so the community edition is a free one um, so it's available uh, from JetBrains and to install it uh, you go to the uh, download page um, now they've got two they've got professional and community and they put professional right up front there so that that's the one you'll accidentally download uh, but if you scroll down uh, you'll see the community edition hidden away here in white text on black uh, so that's the one I'd recommend to download it's a, it's a really really powerful uh, system um, you know there's if you're getting paid for doing Python programming then you might want to consider uh, PyCharm professional but I think the um, the community edition's got a lot to offer it um, offer you uh, in the meantime and uh, it's a really um, excellent development environment okay so we download that uh, then to install it uh, we run through the installation uh, so that's the first screen that you'll get when you're installing it uh, so you click on next and when you click on next it'll take you off to an admin authorization um, page uh, that Windows does uh, so if you've got admin access then sure enough just um, say yes let uh, JetBrains go ahead and install this using admin access but if you don't just say no and um, but continue on and it will go okay so we'll just install Jet Bra we'll just install PyCharm for the user rather than all users and so it'll put it into this um, local user folder just like um, Python did yeah, so app data backslash local and this one's in JetBrains PyCharm community edition so then we we'll click on next uh, you don't need any of these you can you can add a shortcut on the desktop if you want add the bin folder to the path I've never needed that um, open folder as project a context menu so if you've got admin access you can uh, click on that one that's reasonably useful uh, create associations.py um, yeah that's just if you want to um, automatically open PyCharm if you double click on a Python file I've never tried that one um, so it's obviously not necessary uh, in the start menu we'll have a JetBrains folder you can do that that'll work and there we go we can finish so that was it okay um, so now we can uh, run PyCharm and as expected it's in their JetBrains 
section of our start menu and we'll run it okay so this PyCharm is designed just for Python um, so it's not like um, VS Code which is designed for all sorts of languages um, so it does a few things um, better and I think it does virtual environments a bit better than um, than VS Code okay so the first thing we'll do we'll open BPML 200 as a project so let's say open and yep that's the one we'll open So even though um, we've used this in VS Code, we'll also uh, use the same folder in um, in PyCharm. Okay, so it's telling us it cannot run Git um, because we didn't install it using admin privileges. We just used the portable version. So that's the problem there. Um, and there was another thing it was telling us about uh, Windows Defender. So um, you can uh, prevent Windows Defender from doing uh, scans of these files because that can slow your computer down. Alright, uh, Python 3.12.env has been configured as a project interpreter. <laughs> okay. Alright, so when I said this is a brand new install, it did manage to remember something from a previous install I've done. But uh, anyway, let's follow the script and we'll see what we'll do next. Check the so we'll go to file settings project Python interpreter to see which virtual environment it wants to use. So I'm going to just make that bigger. So the file menu is in the <coughs> the hamburger menu. We go to, now it creates file. We go to file settings, and on Mac I think that's called preferences, and it might be in the not in the file menu but in the PyCharm menu. Uh, and then looking down through the settings here we go down to the one that's the project and in the project we can say what Python interpreter uh, we want to use and um, it's it's remembered too so this is not like you wouldn't normally have anything here because um, they uh, if you had a fresh install of PyCharm but I just happen to have one which had those folder names so it's remembered the names I've called them so let's what we'll do we'll create a new one so I'll say show all I want to create a new virtual environment so we're in all the Python interpreters that just means environments so I can create a new one and once again we've got an option between uh, anaconda or virtual env and then you also got these other ones for more advanced Python users um, don't use the system interpreter one Okay, we can select an existing one or a new one. Let's create a new one. Uh, and this one's going to be um, MyVenv, we'll call it. And it's going to be based on Python 3.12 that's uh, installed in AppData. And I'm not going to inherit the global site packages. The only time you would do that is if you're running a, creating a Tekinta type environment. Um, that's the only time I've never, ever needed to do it. Um, and sometimes installing to Kinter in your own virtual environment, it needs access to the global site packages for that to work. Okay, so that'll create. And so now, and it's called us at the name of the project BPAML 200. Okay, that'll do. Uh, and so we look at it, it's only got installed uh, pip 23.2.1 um, but we can upgrade that. But anyway, I'll show you another way to upgrade that. So we'll just click OK. And we look down here in the bottom right, uh, we can see BPAML 200 is the name of the virtual environment that we're using. And you see we've created a few here, we've got myvem, vem200 and .venv. 
Um, so that was the VS Code one. That was the one we created in our command line, and this is the one we created here in PyCharm. Okay, now PyCharm has a has a window called Python Packages, uh, which you, so if you look down the icons down the left hand side here, you can see um, down the bottom one called Python Packages. So we'll we'll bring that up, and that'll look through all the um, Python packages that we've currently got installed and tell us which ones can be upgraded. So it says we've got pip installed, it's currently 23.2.1 and it can be upgraded to 24. Now in VS Code, that actually upgraded automatically for us, um, which is a new behavior. But anyway, in PyCharm it's, uh, it's giving us the option whether we want to keep it there or not. Um, So, I'm just looking at our next few steps. Why don't we choose, we'll, we'll change which virtual environment we're in. We'll choose, um, we'll choose the .venv one that we created in VS Code. So I go to settings and let's choose .venv. And you can see, because I'm just choosing this one because it's got a lot more third-party packages installed, um, so the next bit's going to work a bit better. Okay, so now in our Python packages window, if I bring that up, you can see all the Python libraries that are installed, all the version numbers. And even though we've just installed them, some of them have got upgrades available. And that's because the dependencies um, so you can see there, they can all be upgraded. Uh, what about .env? There it is. So that's 1.0.1. .1. All right. Um, now, when we're using uh, PyCharm, we can create a file called requirements.txt, and uh, that'll list which packages are required. And a quick way of creating that is using uh, the pip uh, command and freeze and that'll just tell us what all the current package numbers are and we can redirect the output of that to a file called uh, requirements.txt. So um, down the bottom left here I bring up a terminal. My terminal tells me which is the active virtual environment like a, and it's even using PowerShell so that's a very good sign. And uh, so let's uh, paste in that um, command pip freeze and I want the output to go to requirements.txt and so here, here you can see the file requirements.txt just got created and it um, and it's put all the version numbers there next to it so that's uh, pretty clever so now we can say that's like taking a snapshot and saying that's what all the version numbers were at the time um, Okay. Now you can change these version numbers. Say I didn't want version 1.0.1, .1, I wanted version 1.0.0 .0 of python.venv. So I save, I change that in the file. PyCharm does automatic saving, so it's already acknowledged that it's got the change, and it's going actually. You, you specified in your requirements.txt, so it recognizes that as a, the conventional file name in this situation. And it said, do you want to install that requirement? So I'll say, yes, let's install that. So remember, we've got 1.0.1 installed, and now it's uh, we've specif specified that we want to use 1.0.0, uh, and so now it's um, it just asks us straight away, well, let, do you want me to do that for you? And I go, yes. Okay, and so now if I go back to the package list and I look at python.env, I can see I've got 1.0.0 installed uh, and I can upgrade that back to 1.0.1 .1 if I need to. You can also click on these and it gives you some information from uh, pippi.org about the file. So that's all very nice. Okay, so now try opening the Jupyter Notebook. And this is where PyCharm Community Edition falls down a bit. Uh, you can't really do a lot 
with it. So um, if you want to do Jupyter Notebooks, you need to upgrade to PyCharm Professional. Um, but that's fine. I don't. Um, I I think VS Code uh, works uh, quite well for for notebooks. So if you if you want to do notebooks, then do VS Code. Um, and that was the answer to Scott's question: uh, Can PyCharm run v Jupyter Notebooks? And it can't. But you you can upgrade to Professional. Uh, I'm sure it works very well. I've never tried it. Um, but that would. Uh, um, but. If you want to do it for free, then you can use uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Okay. Um, so when you're building your Python applications, um, so you've written a few scripts and put them all together in an application, um, and you you want it to um, someone else to be install be able to install it in their virtual environment, and when they install your Python uh, scripts and Python packages you want it to also install any third-party dependencies that you rely on. Um, so I've given a session before, number 168, that tells you how to um, do that, how to build a wheel, which is what um, you install into a, a virtual environment, um, and you use the PyProject uh, folder and set up tools to specify which third-party requirements that you have um, for that uh, package. Okay, so that um, that sums up um, what we've we've done. Uh, community use PyCharm if you you want to do Python uh, scripts and packages and modules. Um, if you're wanting to do Jupyter notebooks and more data science, then and have something that's more similar to Google Colab, then use um, VS Code um, at all times. Try to make sure you're using a virtual environment so that you don't accidentally clobber your system Python or you don't try to use a Python that um, that you've been using for other projects that might have some uh, third-party libraries from those projects that actually have bad side effects on your code as well um, so, yeah, so create a great a virtual environment for every project that you're working on um, you know give them good names or just store them in the folder that um, the projects in uh, don't don't commit the virtual environment to your Git source code repository. Um, it's uh, all you need to commit is a requirements.txt file that can work in VS Code as well. I'm not sure if it recognizes the file, but even if it doesn't, uh, it's just a one line. Uh, you can say pip install and then just say dash r um, to say I'm going to supply a requirements file, and then you give it the name, which is requirements.txt. Uh, so I hope that was useful for you, um, and I hope you've learned something. Next week, um, I'm going to be talking about SSH, which is a, a tool for connecting to remote computers. Not really Python, but um, I don't know any Python programmers who haven't used SSH, so I consider that if you want to be a, a Python programmer, you need to know how to use SSH. Um, and I've, I've got quite a few things that you can do with SSH that most people will not even be aware that it can do it. So it's a, it could be a very interesting session. Um, our next in-person session is April the 23rd. That'll be a Tuesday, not a Wednesday. And it'll... Um, so uh, just because we couldn't get the, ro the room on the Wednesday night, uh, it'll be at a new location in Fortitude Valley. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see what the uh, new venue is like. But it's looking good in the pictures. And um, I look forward to seeing everyone there. Um, on the 17th of this month is Wednesday. Um, Arun should be giving an online session, uh, probably uh, to do, once again, with large language model, model, models in um, machine learning. Okay. Uh, Dana says, thanks. So that's good. And Scott says thanks. Fantastic. Next time. See you next time.